a freelance cold fusion scientist, shows up on the scene with a device that offers great promise, only to be found lacking when put to the test by other scientists. But what if a breakthrough device does, in fact, exactly what its maker says it should do, repeatedly before trained, independent eyes? This vessel is sitting here making, as we watch, helium-4, and the temperature is 215 degrees centigrade. Now, this is a very novel concept that you can have a nuclear fusion occur at 215 centigrade and one atmosphere pressure. Those are very, very mild conditions compared to what they're doing in the plasma fusion and in the H-bomb and so forth. I discovered that using certain standard commercial catalysts, one could get this fusion to occur under reproducible mild conditions. And as I say, this is the key. You change this just a little bit, and it doesn't work. So inside this vessel now for six, seven weeks, we have had deuterium fusing to helium-4 and given this excess temperature of about 35 degrees centigrade, which is big, a really big effect. Now, in the bottom of this vessel, which is heated in this jacket, there's about 40 or 50 grams of palladium on activated carbon catalyst. And this run is now continuing and, and maybe will continue for some weeks or months still. The idea is to test the reliability of the catalyst. The catalyst must work for some months or it's not a viable commercial process. This experiment very much follows along the thought process of uh, Les uh, Case. And uh, behind me you see uh, five different uh, sets of apparatus. Uh, the big vessel here is one of Les Case's, uh, he calls them uh, footballs. It's a stainless steel uh, vessel on a heating mantle uh, set up in exactly the arrangement that Les Case himself is doing in New Hampshire. On the uh, monitor you see displayed in fact the mass spectrum from one of these uh, samples. This is uh, a relatively high level of, uh, of helium-4. Uh, we compare the samples each day that we perform the analysis. We compare the sample of gas from the various uh, active cells and blanks with uh, a sample uh, of room air, uh, which we have measured uh, many, many times and know to be uh, 5.22 parts per million. If the helium is produced by a nuclear process, then necessarily there will be uh, an associated release of uh, heat. It appears that, uh, yes indeed, uh, in the vessel that was producing uh, helium, there was some evidence of excess uh, heat and that the amount of heat produced was approximately uh, quantitatively correlated, that is the right amount of heat was produced uh, compared to that of a nuclear process involving uh, deuteron plus uh, deuteron producing uh, one helium-4 nucleus, which releases 23.8 uh, million electron volts. My objective always has been not to play around scientifically because I'm not really a physicist, but to head towards commercialization. And I really want to go to 100 megawatt reactors, uh, maybe in two or three years, which is really compressing the time scale, but it's maybe possible. So the idea is to scale it up. The technology of catalytic fusion developed by Dr. Les Case is one of the most extraordinary developments we have in the cold fusion field. He has excess heat, massive excess heat, repeatable excess heat, clear null results, and also helium-4 production. Production of the very nuclear ash that the opponents of cold fusion uh, demanded in the early days. Now we have it in spades. It appears as though he is very close to having a self-sustaining device that will keep hot by itself, generate steam, hot water, perhaps electricity, before much longer. An experimentalist who has pioneered another promising cold fusion method, sonocavitation, is Dr. Roger Stringham of First Gate Energies. Using ultrasound frequency, Stringham has observed extraordinarily high temperatures caused by the process of cavitation, where microscopic bubbles in water tunnel their way into target metals, metals like silver, titanium, palladium, 
and platinum are melted by intense heat created during the brief moment it takes for a bubble to collapse. Well, this is a cavitation process going on in the bubble, and the acoustic energy is absorbed uh, by the liquid, and there is a certain point in which it creates small voids which actually grow and then collapse very rapidly. And that is the cavitation idea. The temperatures that are required to create these ejectocytes are at least the melting point of the metal. And it looks like uh, we are actually in the vapor phase, which is gaseous metal. And uh, this amounts to, for the liquid metal, 1,600 degrees Kelvin. And, and for titanium, higher. For the vaporous state, is several thousand degrees higher than that. Stringham is seeking to commercialize his device for use as a home power multiplier that can supplement conventional electric power usage. Transmuting base metals into new, more refined elements was once the long sought after effect of the medieval alchemists. Turning lead into gold was a mythical dream until modern science proved that it could be done, although it required an immense amount of energy, making it highly impractical. Yet as early as 1992, cold fusion experimenters began reporting unusual appearances of trace amounts of different metals, such as copper, silver, chromium, and zinc, when examining their spent cells. Rechecking for possible contamination, scientists like Botrus and Miley confirmed that indeed new metals and isotopes were being formed, transmuted, during the process which produces excess heat. Kevin Wolf made many measurements of tritium. Then he got some even more astonishing results as early as 92, which were these transmutational results, the, the metal forming another metal inside the electrode, you see, which was super, super anti-paradigm. Um, you know, there's that dreadful word alchemy, which we mustn't use, but it, it was a form of that in a way, that was creating new metals, you see. In Japan, Tadayoshi Omori and Tadehiko Mizuno at Hokkaido University have produced volumes of data under rigorously designed experiments showing the production of metals ranging from iron to platinum and beyond. The Omori cell using a tungsten cathode has consistently produced excess energy along with measurable amounts of transmuted metals. Once considered heresy, scientists are discovering that even heavy elements may be transmuted, opening a whole new world of possibilities. Companies like SETI and the Cincinnati Group have drawn the attention of the U.S. Department of Energy by developing processes that remediate radioactive waste. As with the current revolution in genetics, science is beginning to understand that we soon may be able to rearrange the most fundamental units of matter in any way we wish. Science fiction is quickly becoming science fact. If these new sources of energy do turn out to be real, and uh, I say there's possibly several different, totally different varieties. Uh, the question is, what effect will this have on our society, on the future? Well,